there's been an unprecedented amount of censorship, right? Yeah. Especially about international media, Russian media, Chinese media, in the wake of this ongoing now six months of Russia's uh, military uh, intervention in Ukraine. I'm wondering, you know, what are your reactions six months into this, uh, given all that has happened in Ukraine globally and its impact on the work that, you know, that you do and, and that we do? Well, I think it's tragic. It needn't have been. I would go back to last December when uh, Vladimir Putin uh, declared uh, a proposal to the West. Unusually, he made it public to, for us all to read, a proposal for a security compact in Europe. I read this very carefully. It seemed to make a lot of sense to me. Negotiable, of course, highly negotiable. Uh, but there it was, a proposal to settle the disputes, to to once and for all uh, build some kind of security um, um, around Europe, a continent that has known such bloodshed in my lifetime and uh, in the way that it's, that, that the whole post Second World War notion of never again has been forgotten completely. And here we had NATO, NATO forces, in effect, up to the western borders of Russia, the very border where uh, Hitler's armies invaded in 1941, I think, yes, 1941, resulting in some 23 million Russians killed. Anybody who's ever been to Russia and has taken the trouble to visit some of the extraordinary cemeteries such as the one in St. Petersburg, uh, which pays tribute to those who fought for what was then, it was then called Leningrad during the Second World War. I sat in there, I remember a whole day as Shostakovich played over the cemetery. I've never seen anything like it. The numbers lost as the Russians fought for their lives against the Nazis is felt right through that nation today by young people as well. Not by all of them, but by enough young people that in a way that history is a presence. So that's the context for this tragic and invasion of that Russia, that Putin invaded, he should, it shouldn't, you shouldn't invade a sovereign country like Ukraine, it's wrong. But uh, uh, it was, I think I've never seen the last resort invoked um, with such, almost with such historical evidence to back it, almost justification. That doesn't mean to say that one approves it, uh, but uh, the best way of describing it is a tragedy. But there is a truth about what's happened over the last six months, you asked Danny. <clears throat> you believe nothing in the Western media, and I don't say that as a bit of agitprop or something, you just don't believe anything. <laughs> Um, you learn to deconstruct that media that you might be able to get something from. There's no mainstream media in this country, Great Britain, that I would trust. And uh, I can't think of any in the United States that I would trust. But what I, what I seem to have gleaned is that um, it's quite different from what we're told over and over again, which of course is very familiar war propaganda, that uh, Russia probably has completed what it needs and what it's set out to do. 
and that is um, take control of the Donbass, the Russian-speaking Donbass region, which was under constant assault from 2014. Uh, take control of that and to secure Crimea. Now, uh, there is one problem, huge problem here, and that is that the United States has effectively declared itself at war with Russia. The Defense Secretary, I think at a NATO meeting in Poland, said that uh, uh, America's aim was to, um, to wear down, I can't remember the exact words, but that's, I paraphrase it, wear down, uh, in fact, destroy the Russian Federation. So, uh, and the amount of arms, billions of dollars worth of arms, much of it ending up, of course, on the Ukrainian, the infamous Ukrainian black market where a lot of things end up, um, that too. Uh, but American arms pouring in, Ukrainian troops are trained in this country, in Britain, they're trained by American officers. Um, Ukraine was once described as a CIA theme park. Um, all right, perhaps an exaggeration, but not too much. Um, so that's, that means that the two great nuclear superpowers are facing each other. That could go beyond tragedy and become really dangerous. Yeah, in, in, indeed, it, it could very well become dangerous. It, what you describe is a permanent war. I mean, and that's uh, and it, it's usually Russia being described again, just like China as the aggressor, as the aggressor. And in this case, yes, Russia did invade, but it's the United States and its NATO partners that are keeping this going on. And you mentioned December that there was a possibility to prevent any of this from happening in the United States and NATO both. Uh, simultaneously said absolutely not you know uh, so when we say this though we're often derided uh and this is the mccarthy's i want to ask you about this because there's this kind of mccarthy's atmosphere that it has been developed over the course of the last six months or i should say intensified because this has been years in the making but I mean, what do you have to say about those who deride what just the context that you provided as uh, uh, being kind of like a, 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 a propagandist for Russia and and sort of justifying uh, this uh, this uh, invasion and and uh, honestly this really what I think is an exaggeration right the the most impactful or destructive war that we've seen uh, in the region since World War Two. Oh, uh, well, actually, the last one was NATO's illegal assault on Yugoslavia when it blew Yugoslavia to bits. Uh, that was probably more destructive in a sense, but, uh, uh, and uh, well then, then since then, of course, NATO played a part in the invasion of Iraq, which, in which a million people, uh, as a result of which a million people died, the invasion of uh, and destruction of the Qaddafi regime in Libya, which unleashed uh, uh, jihadism throughout the region. So um, this is really just par for the course, as golfers say. Uh, this is what NATO does. It's uh, not even to be critical of it. It's a, it's a, it's a factual description of NATO and it's aggression. Every time that terrible man who is the so-called Secretary General, a Norwegian called Jens Stolenberg, opens his mouth, he salivates almost as a warmonger. Uh, it, this in, in, in 2022, in the continent that lost millions of people, the continent of the Holocaust, the continent of such destruction that has never been seen before. It is just astonishing. Uh, and going back to what I mentioned, the Russian proposals 
were the first. They were a draft. They were obviously for the United States, but for Europe as well, for the European Union. Here you are. This is what we propose to prevent war, to somehow keep our continent peaceful, to see that it doesn't that World War II does not happen again. And they were dismissed. They were, they were mocked. Um, I would have thought that anybody, a regular media consumer, certainly in this country, and certainly in the United States, wouldn't even know they existed. Uh, and right up to when was it February the 24th that Russian troops went into Ukraine? Uh, the provocation continued. We had the had Zelensky, the Ukrainian president. Uh, I think at a at a, a meeting in Germany, threatening nuclear weapons. To he doesn't have nuclear weapons, but his adversary Russia does and threatening a nuclear war. I mean, the recklessness. But then, Danny, this is history. You go back to the beginning of the First World War, the recklessness. The recklessness that was a precursor to every major war uh, in modern times um, is just being repeated again. Uh, this insults our collective intelligence.